Hello trade pros. A few weeks ago I went out to Chicago to visit with Anthony Drager, a good friend and head trader at Market Delta. We had the opportunity to go in and look at the CBOT building. This is where floor traders used to be very active. While taking a tour we had a chance to stop on the trade floor and Anthony Drager told us a little bit about what it was like to trade live on the floor. Also, Anthony gave us a quick little overview of what it was like to trade big size using just your hands. It was an awesome visit to a very historic building and there's a lot to learn. So let's jump into this video and I hope you enjoy watching it as much as we enjoyed filming it. building with traders at lunchtime or whatever it would be flooded with colorful jackets and everything people coming out for smokes or lunch or the break on this plaza so let's walk to the end of the side is this where you used to get in when you uh on the other side uh, so we're close arb your way in this is underneath the L, and I remember when I uh, started my career in this pit, or in, in this exchange, I would, uh, when the market was slow, I was like 24, 25 years old, the market was slow, I'd go to the library for a trade, and I would find a seat back and just take a nap. <laughs> and I remember watching the L go by. here George yeah do you see the, 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 the gate that comes down I don't know if you could see it but it, that's the elevator thing right yeah they would open up but there's the turnstiles and security just to get in the elevators to go up to the different floors so like the floor if you look through there would be above there hey was this your bike that's back in the day that's how I felt after a few trades. Like the middle one, so like this would be the armrest here, yeah. big arms. and then the legs. Wow, yeah. that's really cool. So here's the armrest, and then the legs are up here. Remember those windows you asked me that used to be the floor? Yeah, this is what those windows are on the inside, looking out on the cell and jack. Wow, this is old school. What, is what old. year do you think that would be and like? They used to, with the chalk, write the price updates and everything before Holy the chalk boards, right? So they would write any race different boards these guys you can see on a pit forms same they were doing this for 150 years the only thing that changed was the boards went electronic right that was the biggest change from the floor to something did they have the tape uh, readers at that time they printed out yeah yeah that, that would, these would be the desk brokers that would art the stuff to the clerks that would give it to the broker that would trade them with the locals or also independent traders but you can see all, all the coats on and they're all these would be a pit reporter so when they trade, when it, when they traded a new price, different price, they report it to him, and he report it to these guys to update the board. Oh, that's cool. And there was always pit reporters, even when they went electronic, when they uh, had electronic boards, they would just punch it in there, and the boards would update. You know, and that's how, and that's how the rest of the world would would stay privy to what price was doing. Right. That's, now it's a dome, right? Now it's a chart. This is the hallway or the lobby that you videoed. Right. In. That's the front so end. that's where they would walk in. This is the front door. Those right. As would walk in, walk in through the side. Right. Okay. This is the front entrance that's looking down to the south. This is an old floor. And these were pits before people were on it. You look, see how they had the old truck. Yeah, on the back. That's how they update price. Here's the desk brokers that would be connected by phone with customers around the you know 
off the floor and then these are the pits, obviously. I'd say, George, send them in, send them in. I'd buy as many as I could because I know they're going eight bit. For sure. To sell you 50. So now I'm on 50 contracts from seven. Now so what do you think I'm doing? I'm not even saying 50 at eight, 50 at eight, because I'm on sevens, right? I'm on 50 contracts from seven. I could say 50 at eight, 50 at eight, and make a, a tick, take on yeah. 50 contracts. I would do this. As soon as it turns 8 bid, I'd pretend I was 8 bid, not even pretend, but try to show the market was really strong and I'd offer 9s. 50 at 9, 50 at 9, 50 at 9. Yeah. And then knowing that this guy behind me is 8 bid now for 100, and I can always go to him if the 8s are going to go and say, say 50. Yeah. So you lean on an order. It's another big important element of order flow is where to go with it, like a baseball player. Before it's hit to you, where are you going? How many outs are there? What's the situation? And so with, with the trader is, the open position, where are you going with that? And you should know where you're going to get out before you get in in that sense, because then you can manage your risk a little bit better, you're less emotional and more objective. So if I'm long those sevens and it's eight bit, that means I can make pretty quickly by just selling 50 at eight, I can make a tick, right? Right. But I don't want to make a tick. I think I could sell the nines. I see the two year notes. Yeah, two or three. Yeah, I see the two year, uh, and yeah. I'm going 50 at eight, or I'm going 20 at eight. I'm going to sell 20, or 20 at nine, 20 at nine, 20 at nine. And then all of a sudden, these eights are going here, and I'll just say sell 50. I don't think the advantage back then you had was you could read the market, but you could also read the traders. And like, so does that convert electronically to being able to read the traders on the price ladders? It has to, because the better pit traders knew where the pit was. Was the pit long, was the pit short, too long, too short? And you didn't want to be long if you thought the pit was too long. Why? Because if you're long, you're a seller. If the pit was too long, there's a lot of sellers. So you want to be careful when you're stuck with the herd. So you have to get a really good sense of at what the screen is. The screen is stuck long. We feel like there's a lot of people that are going to come to the market selling to get out of a long position. And how do you read that? One simple technique is there's a lot of buying, aggressive buying you see happening on the dome and on maybe a footprint chart, but yet price can't go up. Right. So think about that. Aggressive yeah. buying, price can't go up. That means there, there's someone bigger than all these buyers absorbing it, right? And all these people are getting long, 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 longer. And that iceberg, as it's called, could create that element of being trapped between too many people long, and then a sell-off is coming. So that's just one technique to start predicting that the herd is building. Right. And the cliff is on its way for that herd to just get run off of. Back in the pit, you would, um, if a broker, for instance, this is how you would do it in the pit. You would see it on a footprint now electronically, or maybe in the dome. I see a lot of aggressive buyers on the offer, but the offer can't go. But in the pit, could you imagine a bunch of traders would go to the broker, and it's, let's say, eight off, and they'd say, hey, I'll buy 20. And the other guy says, I'll buy 50, I'll buy 100. And the broker is still eight off. And he's got, all these guys are buying, buying, buying. I still got more, I still got more. 100 at eight, 100 more at eight, 1,000 at eight. Finally, a trader might say, how many more you got left? I got a lot. Yeah. Well, think about all the guys that just bought a bunch. They're all stuck long and they can't get it to go their way. So that's that broker's order absorbing all those buyers in front of them. Another yeah. good pit trader sees that and like, man, they're getting loaded up over there and getting jammed because he's got a thousand to sell and those guys are all stuck long. So what do you want to do? They you start sell selling the too. Yeah. And then it absorbs the more buyers. Going. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I sell the sevens, I'm short seven and it's seven offer. I know all those guys over there are looking at the sixes. They yeah. Keep their long position. So I'm now, I, I now created the tell or clue that that side of the pit's stuck long. They're the sellers that can keep pressure on this market. I'm lined up on the right side and there's some selling behind me to hit the sixes. So I might not even bid the six to bail them out. That's the, the, the skill set that a lot of people who start trading electronically, which is the only way to start over the last 10 or 15 years, that's the skill set that's missing. The ability to, to combine order flow with intermarket correlations to value price. And what's funny, and George, you and I have talked about this, everybody values price for everything they buy and sell with those two concepts. And then they open up a trading account and they ignore it. Yeah. You go buy a plane ticket, you look at Travelocity and compare it all the planes that were coming to Chicago. You go and you, um, uh, buy a house, the bank appraises all the properties to make sure it's worth the money that they're giving you for the house. Then you open a trading account and you ignore every market but the one you're trading. It's insane. Yeah. You, you don't understand the numbers you're looking at. And, and people need to worry about, they need to worry less about what they think and worry more about what others are thinking.
Right. That's how you sharpen your predictive skills. You know, maybe know what's going to happen next. And then create an exercise to say, let me get good at predicting, predicting the next two bars. So good that it's no longer a guess. It's no longer random. And there's exercises to do that. And you don't have to trade it. Forget about the demo trading or sim trading. Just predict the next two bars and tell me why. And once you're good at that, now you're confident. And the only way, one of the ways to um, minimize fear is to replace it with confidence, which is what? Understanding something. But That's awesome. So you, on your floor days, you use market relationships and pretty much the pit. Like, it, do, you, do you teach that same philosophy today? That's the two most important things I teach. There's some psychology that you have to learn and understand because you can have a great strategy with the greatest concepts and you screw it up. So you need to understand what's going on between your ears, and that's the psychology. But before you understand the psychology, you have to know what drives price. It's order flow and it's a market, your market correlations. It's got to be the two top concepts of anybody who's teaching how to trade uh, or just how to value price. And I joke with people, you want to learn Fibonacci? Go take a Fibonacci chart into a car dealership next time you want to negotiate the price of a car. See if that does you any good. Everybody values it, right? Everybody it's true, goes yeah. to five different dealerships to find a good price. Yeah. And yet they start trading and they don't look at five different indexes that relate to the index that they're trading. It's insane. Yeah. We're all consumers on a daily basis. When it comes time to yes. trading, we feel like we got to be something else for some reason. That's it. Yeah. Or and it's not their fault. It's because you don't know what you don't know. Right. That's what I often say. But just go back, and nobody would debate that. A lot of people would debate the value of uh, relative strength or Bollinger Bands or Fibonacci or Profile. But you can't debate the way to value price for everything you buy and sell is to compare and contrast and then recognize buyers and sellers, which is order flow in this business. When nice. you dig into that, you strip out randomness and you create probability. And then you get good at being wrong and you get good at other things that make a great trader great. But if you don't start with those two core fundamentals of correlation, which is relationship and order flow, then all the rest is a waste of time. Throw those books, I tell people, take all the trading books you got, throw them in the garbage, put them out on garbage day, let the garbage man read them and have him open an account and trade against them. That's what you do with those books. That's good. Unless That's I wrote perfect. a book, which I haven't. If I wrote a book, it would be this thick and it would just go over like some of the e-books and stuff. I think it would be half of that. I don't even think you get that much. No, right. <laughs> you don't need that writing. much. I have trouble reading, let alone writing. Yeah. No, but if you, uh, if you, uh, the e-books and stuff, the education I have is the simplicity and, and the, the practicalness of what was done here and then the reapplication of that into an electronic environment. I traded on the floor for a year. I didn't lose money, but I didn't make money. But it got me the interview, the job, the opportunity to prop for all right, trade pros, there you have it. That's the end to this video. I hope you've learned a lot. And remember this, when you're in front of the screen trading electronically, you have to remember that you're trading against some people and with others. And always ask yourself, am I going with the smart money or against it? It's a market. It's not just a screen with a video game on it. You're trading in a market with other individuals. Knowing how the floor traders used to trade will give you a strong advantage when you're trading the electronic session. You guys take care. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for tuning in. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And when you do subscribe, be sure to hit the bell at the top to receive notifications for our new content. We have videos coming out every day. Thanks so much. Take care and have a great day.